Yes. Welcome to uh, Hopkins. Uh, let me say ceremony. Please all rise for a pledge of allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Davis to come forward and uh, try to talk some good words. Get on. I just stay standing, make it less awkward, unless you want to stay seated if you can't stand. Jesus, we just invite your presence into this meeting, and Lord, I just ask that you would impart a special blessing to each veteran present, uh, that you would uh, allow them to experience your peace and your joy today. But Lord, we just ask for your presence to be around and in the cer ceremony this morning. In your name, Jesus, amen. amen. You can be seated. In Flanders Field is a poem written during the First World War by a Canadian physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae. First published in December of 1915, the readers became inspired and touched. Its verses became universally memor memorialized and school children throughout the United States would recite this poem every Veterans Day. In keeping with tradition, Kiki Fossbender, a sophomore at Hopkins in High School, will do the honors this morning. Hello. Um, in Flannard's fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, that lurk still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flannard's fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep through poppies blow in Flannard's fields. Thank you, Kiki. Now, uh, I'm going to call upon Pastor uh, Rob Davis to come back with his prepared words. <laughs> when Mike asked me to, uh, to share, I was a little reluctant for a number of reasons. One, because I have an accent, and uh, this is Veterans Day, and I said, well, you know, uh, do you really want somebody that's non, uh, doesn't have the right accent speaking at Veterans Day? And secondly, I'm aware of the fact that I am a pastor uh, and not everybody, uh, you know, shares the same faith that, uh, that I do. But I do want to share uh, from my perspective. And uh, I think what uh, Mike was particularly interested in, he said, this might be somewhat interesting to our audience. Uh, if I share my military experience, uh, what I didn't tell him is that it really wasn't that great. And uh, I'll tell you about coming close to being court-martialed, but that's a, uh, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, I am an American citizen. <laughs> I uh, only hold one passport, and that is an American passport. I've been uh, the lead pastor at the Hopkins and Vineyard here in town for 21 years and uh, it's been a great town to, to serve in, and many of you have helped us uh, uh, with building issues and getting to where we are. And uh, it's been an honor to, uh, to be, uh, you know, a pastor in this town. But uh, I wanted to touch on two pretty well-worn phrases, freedom is not free, and God bless America. Well, uh, 
you know, I don't know that I can add a whole lot of original thought to uh, freedom is not free except to reiterate thank you for serving because there's always uh, enemies and other forces that if we don't defend ourselves, uh, we will be attacked and it does cost and it is costly to have a country that is uh, free. And uh, for many of us that weren't born in this country, I've recognized that there's an elevated um, appreciation for the values of America. And uh, in many cases, it's immigrants like myself, which uh, seem to be more excited about uh, the American core values than many Americans. And it's like, come on, can you guys be more patriotic? I mean, this country is pretty awesome. You know, uh, defend it, live for it, speak well of it, don't uh, defile it. So uh, all I can say on uh, that is freedom is not free. Thank you very much. But on this other phrase, uh, God bless America, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, you may or may not agree with me on many of these thoughts. Uh, but let me just say it this way. I want to read uh, two short passages from the Old Testament, uh, which I think would summarize where I'm coming from uh, when it comes to God bless America. And uh, the first one is out of the book of Deuteronomy. And the context of this story is pretty well known to many. Uh, Moses is leading the the Jewish people into their promised land. And he's about to take them over the Jordan River and move into the land. And he basically says, listen, this is not going to be easy. Uh, he said, the people there are pretty big. They're pretty powerful. And uh, you're going to have to overtake them and conquer them. And when you've overtaken them and conquered them, don't get too arrogant. Don't think that you were so smart, your military prowess was so great. I just want to remind you that I am God and I'm going to do this before you. I'm going to make this happen. Um, and then there's another little context there before I read. I'm pretty much telling the story, but you might not believe me, so I'll read it uh, as well. Uh, but he, he, he says, listen, you know, the problem is not that you people are so holy talking to the Jewish people, talking to, you see, it's not like you're so holy and that you're so great and you're so wonderful. It's really that the people in that land are really awful and they are really bad. So I just want to kind of remind you guys about this fact before we go in. So let me read the story. Listen, O Israel, today you're about to cross the Jordan River and take the land belonging to the nations much greater and much more powerful than you. They live in cities with walls that reach to the sky. The people are strong and tall, descendants of the famous Anakite giants. You've heard the saying, who can stand up to the Anakites? But recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. I mean, that's just a great analogy with all those fires in California. You know, like just nothing can stop it. It is a devouring fire. And that's the analogy that God gives. When he's for you, when he's working with you, just nothing will stop it. He will subdue them so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out, just as the Lord had promised. After the Lord your God has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. No, it is because of the wickedness of the other nations that he is punishing them out of your way. It is not because you are so good or have such integrity that you are about to occupy their land. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you only because of their wickedness. And to fulfill the oath, he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you are good, for you are not. You are a stubborn people. <laughs> now, don't you just like that? Now, the point that I'm trying to get here to here is this. When we say, God bless America, uh, I think there's a little bit more to it. Uh, in other words, if we can be like righteous, uh, in good standing, loving and caring, I think we could say, God, can you help us out? You know, but if we're not, 
it's kind of difficult for us to say, God, you know, bless us, but not bless the, these other folks. There's another story many uh, years later, different context, different, uh, different king. Uh, and this is King Asa, and uh, he's fielding off an attack. The, the Ethiopians are coming to attack them, and uh, the story goes as follows. Once an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. They advanced to the town of Mesha, and Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley north of Mesha. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God. Okay, here's the reality. You're looking out of the battlefield, you're overwhelmed, you're outnumbered, you're outgunned. O oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O oh Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is your name that we come against this vast horde. O oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah and uh, saw them, uh, watched them fully. And they just fled from there. Uh, again, when we say God bless America, you know, I do think God will bless America if we will uh, bless the Lord. I mean, if we honor the Lord, we will serve the Lord. Uh, we'll love the Lord and do the things that the Lord wants us to do. Now, I recognize in an audience like this, not everybody uh, would have my perspective. Uh, many people would say, look, if there's a war, you know, if God's for you, that's great. God being against you, it's not great. But I also understand that in the vast number of situations, people would say, I don't believe in God and I don't believe God takes sides in a war. And to that, I would say, I, I probably agree with you. In many wars and conflicts, I don't think God's on one side versus the other. But what I am trying to say is when we say God bless America, I do think that when we are at least uh, living the way the Lord wants us to live, we can ask God to bless America. And if we're not, we can't expect God to be fighting before us. Or saying it differently, it doesn't matter how much strength, might, power you have. If you don't have the Lord on your side, it just won't go well for you. And, you know, as we get mired in all sorts of conflicts, we need the wisdom and the help of the Lord, not just our own uh, ideas and our own experiences. I don't want to talk too much on that. I want to uh, share my own military experiences. I grew up in South Africa, and uh, I was in the unfortunate situation of being in the midst of the apartheid uh, movement uh, when it was coming to a peak and uh, military service was compulsory and uh, so in my particular uh, age group when you finished high school you had to do compulsory military service for one year. However if you volunteered for an extra six months uh, making it 18 months you had no further military commitment after that. So uh, that's what I did. I volunteered for the extra six months and after 17 months, the government changed the law because the pressure internally was getting uh, pretty uh, strict, uh, pretty heavy. And at this point, uh, South Africa was fighting wars on all, all fronts. In the northeast, uh, the northwest against Angola, we were fighting, uh, really it was the, the Cubans were helping uh, Ang Angola. And on the northeast side of Mozambique, uh, we were fighting really financed by the Russians. The Russians weren't involved like the, the Cubans were. But they were really um, something that South Africa could take care of. But what they couldn't take care of was the apartheid uprising and the problems. And so when the police couldn't handle it, they brought in the military. So I'm just about to finish my service. And they changed the law and they said, no, now it's two years compulsory service, uh, whether you like it or not. So we're just finishing up the two years, and they say, okay, now we're changing it again. Uh, you finished your two years compulsory service, but you need to serve three um, reserve service call-ups, so one per year for three years. So uh, I started, I did that, uh, and after I'd done two, the government changed the law, and they said, well, we need you to do five. 
So uh, I kept serving, and after four, guess what? The government changed the law and said you need to do seven. Now at this point, it's costing me uh, from a career standpoint, it's costing me from an education standpoint, and uh, I wasn't exactly the ideal soldier. Let me just say that out front. Uh, my particular woes came when I wanted to write my accounting board exams, and it just so happened that this came at the same time that the, the military required my services to go fight in Angola for three months, and I'm looking at this and I asked for an exemption or a postponement, and uh, they kindly said, no, uh, you do not have a case. You're merely writing your board exams, which you've studied for six years for. That's trivial. We need you. To which I decided, I'm not going. Well, that's not a good move when you called up for military service and you don't go. Uh, it's called AWOL. And uh, what was worse is my wife's brother, it was in the military police in my exact unit. <laughs> this wasn't a good deal. So uh, I wrote my final board exams with diarrhea and with a lot of nervousness. And after I'd finished them, I phoned uh, the captain of my brigade and I said, I've completed my exams. I am reporting for duty, to which he informed me, don't bother. We are going to court-martial you. So I said, okay, well, I will wait for that outcome. Uh, fortunately for me, I was in the head office uh, of a brigade. And so what happened is they, start, they started prosecuting each of the units in the brigade. And by the time they got to the head office, they had run out of time because it was the next calendar year and they needed to do the next call up. So uh, with about two weeks to spare before my court martial date, they dropped the charges, to which I was greatly uh, relieved, knowing that if I was convicted, I lose my passport, I cannot travel, and you spend time in a military prison, and you have a criminal record, which doesn't bode well for emigrating to America, for instance. Uh, but that was uh, one of my uh, trials, but really the, the, the last trial was the worst uh, in the military for me. Our unit was assigned to a suburb of Johannesburg called Soweto, and Soweto was a, uh, probably had a million people, all black folks in segregated South Africa, and they were rioting. And typically what would happen is uh, the military, the South African military was very well equipped, and the uprising of blacks was very uh, unsophisticated. And so uh, teenagers, like 14-year-olds, they would make Molotov cocktails, which would be a petrol bomb, you know, with a rag and a, a glass bottle, and they would just throw it and create havoc and set buildings on fire and whatever not. But when it was overwhelming, the police couldn't handle it, they'd call us in. But here's the problem. When uh, we were called in, we would open up with machine guns and just start firing and just killing, just randomly. And these 14-year-olds would be running like crazy and just mow them down. And I said, I am not willing to do that. Now, I don't know what kind of a unit you've been in, but in my situation, my officer in charge of the armored car that we were in, if I refused to shoot, he had the authority to shoot me. And he probably would have because there was a lot of tension about people that are for or against the government. And I wasn't like for this idea. So I again decided, well, you know what? I am not going to this next call up. I am leaving the country, which is actually what I ended up doing. So uh, uh, fortuitously uh, was able to, to leave the country. My wife got a great job offer here in Boston and uh, that's how I ended up uh, showing up here in Boston. I don't have, you know, a great story. People often say, well, were you called as a pastor to, you know, preach here in Hopkins Center? And my story is, nope, I came following my wife. She had a great job offer, and I, immigration a lawyer said, listen, we don't need accountants. We need, my wife's an occupational therapist. We need an occupational therapist. You guarantee to get a green card, and as soon as we could, I got my green card, and as soon as I could apply for citizenship, I applied for citizenship and happily threw my other passport away, uh, and that's where it is today. Uh, it's gone. 
But I do want to say, of all my negative uh, experiences in the military, there is something about military um, service that is very positive. And uh, for me, there were a number of things that were super positive out of it. One is, you know, you grow up as a man. I mean, coming out of high school and going to military service, there's something about the order of things which is great. There's something about structure. There's something about respecting uh, those that have rank and those that are above you, whether you agree with them or not, whether you like them or, or don't. You start respecting the rank and you listen to it. There's something very helpful about that. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the physical exercise. I enjoyed all the drills. I enjoyed the running. I enjoyed that, that aspect of it. Uh, I also enjoyed the crazy places and the crazy things that you do when you're in the military. I mean, I got licenses to drive all sorts of heavy equipment, and it, it was fun. And uh, we did, like, stupid things, crazy things. You get out and go to places that... I mean, it's amazing. We've got Norman here, uh, the, the, the town manager. You know, one of uh, the decisions uh, our government made was Zimbabwe was falling apart. That's a country next up from South Africa. And so they decided, uh, sort of like we're deciding here with Mexico, is to build a wall. But uh, what our decision was, was we were going to build a wall of sisal. Now, I don't know if you know what sisal is, but it's a big sort of thorny plant. It's a, sort of about from there to here. And we planted them 12 deep, like over terrains like this, you know, because you could not get through it. You couldn't take an armored car, couldn't get through it. And the only way to get through it is hack it with the machete, and then they'd fly over with a, a plane. So, oh, they hacked it there. We'll find them. So, you know, you do all these crazy things in the military. You go to places and do things. But I just say for those of you that have served, this is a great country. I thank you. I, you know, freedom is not free. It's because you've served, it really helps, and I do pray that God blesses America, but more importantly, I pray that God blesses you today uh, with your relationships, with your health, and uh, really with a sense of peace. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I've got one last thing. I forgot about this. Oops. One of the things the church does, our church does at Thanksgiving, is we give away a Thanksgiving basket. And I'm offering this to anybody that's a veteran or anybody that needs something. It's a basket about this big with a frozen turkey and all the trimmings. It's totally free. There's no obligation. We deliver it to people's homes. So if you need one or if you know anybody that need, needs one, uh, just let me know. I'll take down your details. We, we come to your house. Actually, there is... Uh, an obligation. There's, they'll probably pray for you when they deliver the turkey. That, that's so. But do speak to me. Thank you, Mike. Sir. Thanks so much, Rob. David Melly is here uh, from Carolyn Dykeman's office here. I'd like to say a few words, Dave. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks everyone uh, who's here today, and uh, thank you everyone who has served in our military. That is going to be a very hard uh, act to follow since I have not been to South Africa and do not have <laughs> nearly as fascinating a life story <laughs> as that. But um, I did want to talk a little bit um, about my story and why I'm here. Um, so I am Representative Carolyn Dykema's Chief of Staff, um, and. Carolyn uh, represents Hopkinton along with Holliston, Southboro, uh, and part of Westboro. Um, and we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with a lot of great veterans and military families, veterans advocates, folks who serve every day uh, this community, both Hopkinton, the greater community, but then also specifically the veterans community. Um, and the work that they do is incredible and meaningful. Um, and one of the things that is always so impressive to me is thinking about these folks who have served in the military who go on to continue to serve in public service and to continue to go back to their communities and their towns and keep that, you know, that drive, that passion, that desire to serve others going when they've already done so much for all of us and for their families and for their country. Um, and so I sort of 
you know, started thinking about what I wanted to talk to today. And I thought about, you know, why, why is that? Why are, and I can tell you, we work with a lot of folks in this job, and veterans advocates are <laughs> the most hardworking, the most punctual. Uh, if you ever ask any veteran to do anything, you better be sure you actually want them to do that because they will have already by the time you finish asking them. Um, they are, you know, truly go above and beyond in terms of giving back to the communities um, even after they have, you know, left military service and entered, um, you know, their private lives. Um, so to kind of talk about that, I wanted to talk about a little bit about my family story um, and why, he, you know, I'm here. Um, I grew up in Newton, down the road, um, and actually uh, both of my grandfathers are from Boston. Um, both of them served in the Air Force. They did not know each other, but <laughs> they were both in uh, the Air Force. And my mother's father uh, grew up in Roslindale. Um, he was the son of Italian immigrants, and he joined the Air Force when he was, I think, 18 years old. Um, he was down at Falmouth um, in Otis Air Force Base. Uh, my mother was born at Falmouth Hospital because he was serving down there, and my grandmother was down there with him. Um, and about two, three years into his service, um, he was on an aircraft uh, working as a radar technician um, when the aircraft went down over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and there were 19 men aboard the aircraft, and he was one of only three survivors. Um, my mother was about a year old at the time. My grandmother was actually pregnant when this happened and actually ended up uh, losing the baby that she was pregnant with um, related to, you know, the stress and the impacts of this experience. Um, and obviously that, you know, whether it's fate or faith or chance or whatever you might believe, you know, there were 19 men aboard that aircraft and um, my grandfather was one of only three who made it. Um, and fortunately, uh, my grandparents are, you know, both still alive. They've been married almost 60 years. They have four kids, eight grandkids, no great grandkids yet, which is kind of my fault because I'm the oldest. <laughs> um, but uh, they, you know, have had these wonderful lives and they've continued, um, you know, had the opportunity to be in the community and to come back. You know, my grandfather came back after his service. Um, he left the military and um, could have done anything with his life and he actually decided to continue being in public service um, in everyone's favorite branch of the government, the post office. Um, <laughs> and actually uh, he was a postmaster for many years, that was his career. And actually my aunt, his daughter, is also a postmaster now still. Um, and you know, the post office is kind of like my job sometimes where, you know, folks that come in, they are not always happy with us. <laughs> um, you know, they, um, a lot of times if you're serving them, you know, that's things going as according to plan, but the stuff that sticks in folks' heads is when things don't go according to plan and, you know, maybe someone is not so happy with you or is angry with you and you're trying to help them regardless. And um, I think, you know, fortunately my job is super rewarding in that we often um, get to do really meaningful work, um, you know, serving folks and, and being able to help them with things that end up making a huge difference in their lives. Um, the post office, uh, I would say maybe is not as high stakes as that sometimes, but it's still an important part of, you know, our day-to-day -day lives. And um, both my grandfather and my aunt have one thing in common, and that's that they love people. And, you know, for people who have chosen to be in public service and, and spend their whole lives in public service, I think that is so critical. And one of the things that, you know, they have had that's kept them you know, involved in the way that they are is that they really see that as a people-facing job. And, you know, it might not be glamorous or exciting or thrilling, but it's, you know, it's important. And it's something that um, they take, you know, are very seriously and are proud of. And I'm proud to be in a, you know, family that in one way or another has been committed to public service. Um, and that that is really something that emerges from that, you know, feeling that sense of, you know, duty and purpose that so many of our veterans have. And I think part of that comes back to, you know, the idea that when my grandfather was one of, you know, three of 19 men who survived, not everybody has that chance to go on and lead that, you know, happy, long, productive life. And so many veterans that we get to work with, I think, have that sense of 
we are serving our communities, we're continuing to give back because um, we have the chances that many of the folks that we went into military service with did not have. And uh, I'll embarrass Mike for a second here. <laughs> um, Mike is a perfect example of this. Um, he's one of those guys who goes above and beyond for everybody that he works with. And a couple months ago, there was a guy, I think in Bellingham, right? A homeless vet that Mike was helping out. Um, and Mike would come into, he works down the street from us, so he comes and visits us in the state house every once in a while. And Mike would come into the office, you know, every couple days, um, you know, hey, I went, you know, went and visited him in his tent. He was, you know, he, he's not sure what he wants to do. He doesn't trust a lot of the folks that he's working with. And so Mike would go visit him and help him fill out this form or go make sure he went to this appointment and this hearing and getting him the services that he needs. But this probably went on for, for a month, right? You know, at least that, if not longer. And, and Mike obviously is great and goes above and beyond. But I would actually say that Mike is pretty typical of a lot of the veterans that continue to work in public service and that they all have that same level of dedication and passion for serving others and continuing to have that lifelong commitment to public service even after they've left the military. And that is one of the things that makes my job and, and my work so rewarding to get to work with people like that. Um, but it also, I think, is a good role model for the rest of us, you know, to be able to go through life thinking we are fortunate to have the opportunities that we have and we're fortunate to have the chance to work to serve others and to serve our communities and to give back and that we shouldn't, you know, any day, but especially on a day like Veterans Day, ever take that for granted that we have this opportunity to, you know, contribute in some way, big or small, and that that is something that the folks who serve in the military, you know, they know that to the very core of their soul, but I think all of us um, you know, who have benefited from that service um, can take that kind of same attitude forward in all of the work, you know, whether it's in our jobs or in our family life or just in our communities, you know, everything that we do day to day, that's something that we can all try to emulate. So um, in closing, I just wanna say thank you all so much. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have the job that I have and do the work that I do. And one of the things that makes it so great is to get to work in such a great community. So thank you all for being here. And again, thank you all who um, have served this country and do such great work. So thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, and our last speaker, uh, Hopkinton veteran, most of you know him very well, Ted Hoyt. Good morning, veterans, family members, guests. Welcome on this beautiful, crisp morning. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me to speak. This, uh, my name is Ted Hoyt. I live here in Hopkinton, down by Lake Maspinock, with my wife and 13 children. Oh, sorry, uh, three children. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like 13. Um, Technically, I spent 23 years in the Army. The last 10 was really my name on a list, so I can't really count that. Um, I do have a lot of military in my family. My dad was Maritime Academy Naval Reserve. My younger brother retired after 23 years as a Navy SEAL. My cousin slash brother uh, retired as a Master Chief from the Air Force after 27 years. My wife's family has even more military than I. Uh, her older brother retired as an Air Force doctor and now works for the VA. Her younger brother is currently an F-22 pilot, trying to figure out if he's going to transition to the 35 or what's going to happen there because his base down in Tyndall in Florida was wiped out by the hurricane. Um, her uh, dad, my father-in-law, uh, who some of you have met, has come to the breakfast uh, uh, on occasion, uh, is a retired uh, Coast Guard. Was our, our Coast Guard is, is here. Um, uh, but he started out in, as a Marine. Uh, so uh, uh, he's Marine and Coast Guard. And then finally, uh, my wife's father, grandfather, my grandfather-in-law, 
uh, was a distinguished graduate, uh, fifth generation West Pointer, so Army. So we have all the bases covered. We have all the branches covered in my family. And hopefully that means that I won't be boring or overlong with this speech. Uh, so I had trouble coming up with this speech. Um, I asked my younger brother, the squid, if I could borrow a speech that he gave a few weeks ago up in Toronto. Uh, it, he said yes. Uh, and even though he's a central character in the, in the greatest uh, barroom brawl story ever, um, he is a squid, and he never actually ponied up the speech. So I had to write it this morning, and I hope you'll all uh, uh, bear with me if it's a little jumpy because I had a lot of cross-outs here. Um, I had to figure out what I would say to you, uh, say especially to the veterans on this day to honor veterans. Uh, what should I talk about? Should I talk about combat? Um, many of you have seen much more combat than I have. And I thought, well, talking about that would seem a little contrived or trite. Um, I also thought about talking to you about the state of the military. Uh, I went to Atlanta uh, about a week and a half ago and saw my uh, classmate, who's the very first four star in my class, uh, he's the undersecretary of, the, uh, sorry, the un vice chairman of the army, uh, and he gave a speech on the state of the army, and it was generally considered by all all there to be really boring and really long. So I decided I'm not going to give you the state of the military address here. Um, I respect some of you too much, right? Uh, and then I thought about what binds us together, specifically the veterans, but also the veterans' families. I, I, I belong to a charity that takes care of the Gold Star families, tries to. Um, what, what binds us together? Uh, and I thought that it might be uh, that we all have all shown a willingness to some degree to fight and sometimes die for this country. Uh, then I asked, well, what does country mean? What does that mean? Um, what are we really willing to fight and die for? Is it the geographic piece of land uh, that we happen to be sitting on now? Um, and I thought, well, I have family in Canada and I've been all over the world and there's a lot of nice land all over the world. I don't think it's just the land that we can say that we're willing to fight and die for. Um, and then I thought, well, If not the land, is it the people? And I think this is a little bit closer to uh, you know uh, uh, the right answer. Uh, but what makes it the people? What makes us Americans? Um, what does this country? What does this nation mean? Right. So we have the benefit uh, of saying uh, here in this country, we have the benefit of saying we're from everywhere. Right. So we're. Native Americans, we're European Americans, we're African Americans, Asian Americans, we are from everywhere. So given that, what makes us Americans? Um, I settled on the idea that it must be our ideals, right? The ideals of being a, a, an American and what does that mean? Uh, we don't have the luxury of fighting for a homogeneous people, right? So we're not fighting for our tribe. We're fighting for America and the ideals of what America stands for. Um, I thought about uh, Abe Lincoln's speech that we've all heard many times, the Gettysburg Address, right? F a, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Okay, and what does that mean? What are, what are those uh, that we fight for our personal freedoms, right? That that uh, that. And not not the, the trite word freedom that sometimes we hear too often used too lightly, um, but fundamental and real freedoms like the freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of religion, uh, and, and some might say sadly the freedom of the press, but I actually think that that's a really important freedom. Uh, so it's these freedoms that make us special. It's these ideals uh, that we're willing to fight for. 
um, this is what it means for us to be Americans. Uh, and this, if they are truly threatened, are worth fighting and dying for. Many of you here have shared bread with me at the veterans' breakfast. Um, all of the soldiers, all of the veterans here have uh, eaten their pound of salt together. Um, and many of our friends have died for the American ideals that I've described. Uh, I ask, will these ideals be passed to my children who are here? And you can feel free to talk to them after. Um, will they be passed to them? And, and I don't know the answer to that question. They face many challenges, the technological world that we live in, um, you know, but, but I hope and pray that somehow that they'll get to understand these ideals and that they'll protect them in, in their own way, that they'll uh, adopt them and protect them. Um, these are the ideals that our friends died for. Um, and I ask for your help. Your mission is not done. My kids don't listen to me, but they might listen to you. And it makes it our collective mission to pass the torch, to teach them what it means to be brave and free. So please, your mission is not done until the last full measure. Teach them by your presence and bearing. But if you have the opportunity, try to talk to them, to those grandkids, to those great grandkids, to the random ragamuffins that you might see in, in, in meetings like this, and teach them the ideals of why we were willing to fight and die. Continue the mission. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. As we, the members of our local American Legion post, have the honor of having a small part during the services for our departed Hopkinton veterans, we would like to share a prayer that we deliver at the calling hours following the death of each veteran. Generation after generation, all the people of the past have lived as we live perplexed and mystified by death. There is no doubt of an afterlife for all who have been loyal and true. A life to which peace shall come, where the burden shall be lifted, and the heartache shall cease. With the hope and fulfillment that escapes us here will be given to us to be ours forever. All the veterans we remember this morning had a Hopkinton connection, and our thanks and gratitude go to their families as we share our memories of them. These are the men and women who have passed away since our last Veterans Day. Joseph Sullivan, 92, a U.S. Navy veteran of World War II. He was a Newton police officer for 30 years. He leaves five children. 16 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Billy Mackin, 85 years old, U.S. Navy Korean War veteran, appliance repair and appliance repair instructor. Billy left six children, 11 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Emery Angus McKenzie, 88 years old, United States Navy Korean War veteran, Worked as an electromechanical design engineer for Raytheon. He had 11, I mean, eight children, nine grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. Arthur Lowell, 89, United States Army Korean War veteran, quality control engineer at Fenwall. Arthur left four children, six grandchildren, and, and four great grandchildren. Edward Bell, 95 years old, United States Navy World War II veteran, left two children, two grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Norman Hartnett, 
96, U.S. Navy World War II veteran, longtime VA employee, was the Chief of Staff of the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. He left a large family. Madeline Frances McBride, 94 years old. Babe was a 1942 grad of Hopkins in High School. She became an Air Force nurse and served for many years. Stanley C. Stenberg, 86, United States Air Force veteran of the Korean War. He left five children, five grandchildren. Richard Denham, 85, United States Marine Corps, veteran of the Korean War, longtime employee of the Fallen Company. He left three children. More recently, Teddy Gassett, 76 years old, Hopkins in High School, 1961. Army National Guard, Teddy left two children, four grandchildren. Peter K. Famolito, 69, Army National Guard. He was an electrician, leaves his wife, his siblings, and a niece and a nephew. As we conclude this Veterans Day observance, I want to recognize everyone here in attendance and their ongoing contribution to our town. Those of you who make all the sacrifices of your time and your money and that never-ending balancing act with family, work, and community service, sure, there is some personal satisfaction gained, but it's also nice to be recognized by those whom are grateful. This year, we sent out postcards to all the Hopkinton residents who were identified as military veterans, informing them of the Veterans Day activities. I included my contact information on those cards, and some veterans call with questions. One particular call came from a veteran who told me that he had lived in many places over his long life and they had only been residing in Hopkins for a couple of years. But he wanted to tell me that his experience here in Hopkinton and the people he has met has led him to conclude that this is the best place to live in the world. Thanks to all of you. Semper Fi and God bless America.